Welcome back everyone to the School of Greatness podcast. Very excited I got my good friend Michael Hyatt. Good, good to see you. Good to see you, buddy. Very excited. New York Times bestselling author and got a new book out called Living Forward, a proven plan to stop drifting and get the life you want. We'll have it all linked up here in the show notes and also on the YouTube channel below. Make sure to check out this book. We're here in San Diego. We're at a social media conference. And uh, when did I first meet you? Probably like four years ago, right? Maybe yeah, it was probably about four years ago. Yeah. Then, of course, you came to Nashville and yep. stayed at my home. Yes. Got to meet amazing. my family. That, that was, was amazing. That was amazing. And um, I've been to Nashville twice with you, right? Oh, wow. We did, like a, we did a, a Nashville Mafia, which I have. Which the, was a blast. Which I have the photo in my, my studio, which was awesome. And then I came back and did your podcast for my book, so I appreciate you having me on there. you got to come back again so we can do another Nashville media I'd love to. meetup. Maybe next year when my book comes out, we'll do it again. Okay, good. I'll host you. <laughs> and when's your next book coming out? You don't know yet. Uh, probably about a year and a half. Yeah, so around the same time. We'll yeah, good. Same okay, yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Michael is uh, an incredible leader in the online space, but you're also a publisher. You, you had a, a publishing company for a number of yeah, years, Yeah, well, right? I spent my entire career practically uh -huh. in the book publishing world. Uh, most recently as the chairman and CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishers. Yes. But I left that in 2011 to go uh, stake my claim in speaking and online marketing and all that, wow. something I'd always dreamed of doing. Right. And I'm loving it. Five years, just past my five-year anniversary and you, unit. You've blown up. You, can, you wrote a book called Platform, right? First, yes. First one? That's right. And uh, your audience is just blown up. Your blog is, I don't know, probably one of the top blogs in the leadership space. You're getting, yep. what, a half a million visitors a month, yep. somewhere around about, there? Yep, about a half a million. You've got a huge uh, uh, online marketing course called Platform University, correct? Right. And uh, you just do an incredible job. So Thank you. If anyone wants Thank to you. learn how to become a leader in this space, follow Michael Hyatt. Now you've got this book out called Living Forward, and you break it down with asking three questions, right? I do. And what are those three questions? Okay, before we do that, yes. Um, can we talk about the drift? Because yeah. this like sets the whole thing up. A lot of people are in the drift. A lot of people are in the drift. A lot of people. And what is the drift? Okay, so uh, my wife Gail, we've been married for 38 mm -hmm. years. In fact, she's flying in tonight. Can't wait to see her. Yes. Uh, but after we'd been married about 10 years, we decided to go on a vacation in Hawaii and celebrate our anniversary, except we we're pretty much broke. Right. So cashing <laughs> all the airline miles, uh, <laughs> right, right. we got there, we rented a car, got a hotel, but we didn't really have any money left over for uh, entertainment. Yes. But um, we decided to go snorkeling because the lessons were free. Mm. So we took our lessons, they took us out on the reef. Have you ever snorkeled in Hawaii? Uh, yes, but not like far out. Oh far my out. gosh! It's, I mean, it's insane. It, it exploded. Yes, it's insane. So we said I saw, I saw an eel when I was doing it, and I kind of got scared, so I haven't been out. That there would yet. freak me out. It's not like a little eel like hissing at me. So I was like, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go back. Well, we found out we could rent snorkeling gear for like ten bucks for the whole week. So yes. we said, okay, cool. So next morning we went to the lagoon that was adjacent to our hotel. Uh -huh. It was the water was crystal clear, totally calm. There wasn't another soul out there. It was yeah. really early in the morning. And we started paddling around, and it was like swimming in an aquarium. Wow. You know, all the fish, multicolored fish, the seaweed swaying in the sunlight, mm -hmm. and we were just totally captivated. Finally, after about 45 minutes, I decided to look up. I went, oh my gosh. We had drifted, got caught in a riptide, mm -hmm. and we were so far out to sea, thankfully we were together, we were so far out that the hotel looked like a postage stamp in wow. the distance. Scared me to death. Like a mile away or something? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's far away. I, yeah, far away. And Gail lifted up her head. She screamed. She said, what are we going to do? We had a boogie board, thankfully. I said, we're going to swim like crazy and try to get back. And I didn't even know you're not supposed to swim against a riptide. Mm. Fortunately, I think it had you know, gone out by that time. Yeah. But we swam hard for 45 minutes, maybe an hour, pulled ourselves up on the beach, collapsed, and we'd never been snorkeling again till last fall. <laughs> I mean, it's such a scary experience. It's scary. But this is how most people live their lives. Yeah. You know, they don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, you know, I think I'm gonna stop taking care of myself, start eating junk food, mm -hmm. get really sick, and maybe if I'm lucky, I'll have a heart attack. Yeah. Or they don't, oh, you know, walk away after getting married and say, I think I'll stop dating my spouse, stop connecting, and end up separated or divorced. That, that doesn't happen, they drift to that mm -hmm. end because mm -hmm. they don't have an intention to do anything different. Yeah. And you see it in careers, you see it in health, you see it in marriage, you see yeah. it in parenting. And so if this book has a villain, it's the drift. Because living with intention, creating a life plan is the exact opposite. Mm. And probably 2% of the people in the world um, don't fall into the drift. They're living intentionally. Right. They're creating their outcomes. But the main thing is that people never drift to a destination they would have chosen. What do you mean? 
I mean, you, you're going to somewhere you don't want to be. You're going to go someplace you don't want to be. Yeah. You're going to find yourself. You're not going to land in success when you're drifting. I, I mean, it might happen, right. but it's Probably very not. unlikely. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, even the ones at the top 1% who are intentional can sometimes be in the drift for a week or a month totally. or get off track. I mean, it happens something. to me. Yeah. It happens yeah. to all of us. You know, yeah. where I just, uh, I mean, just recently, I just went through the book promotion here. And so for six weeks, that was all. I was doing. You were uh, you were in the drift while you were promoting to not be in the drift. Uh, exactly. Yeah, I yeah. mean, so you know, I wasn't working out like yeah. I normally do. You're having junk food a little bit here and there. I'm You're traveling like crazy. Yep. Yeah. So you know, you just have to get back and dial it back in and swim for the shore and yeah. get more intentional. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. So for those that are in the drift already, is it too late for them? Absolutely not. Okay. Yeah, that's the cool thing. Yeah. So there's at any point along the way you can get intentional, and and what Daniel and I advocate in the book is creating a life plan. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know how much experience you had creating strategic plans, but in the corporate world where I came from. That's all you do, huh? I, I mean, we'd go off for a three-day retreat <laughs> with 70 people. We'd create this huge strategic plan notebook, and it would have timelines and resort lists and wow. Gantt chants and all that stuff. We'd bring it home, put it on the shelf, never look at it again. Right. So that's not what we're talking about. Right. So with a life plan, you're talking about a brief, simple document that you create. You can't outsource it. Mm -hmm. But it's only about 12 to 15 pages long. Right. But it covers every area of your life and it really talks about what you envision for a better future. What are the destinations that you want to visit? What does perfect health look like for you? What does mm -hmm. a great relationship with a significant other look like? What does your career or your business look like? Right. And so we take you through that process in the book, and that's where the three questions come in. Amazing. Okay, so what are the three questions? What's okay. the first one? I thought you'd ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, first is, the first one is, how do you want to be remembered? Uh -huh. Now, here's why this is such a powerful question. Um, Stephen Covey said, start with the end in mind. Well, this is like the ultimate of that. This is like the last moment. The last moment. So we invite you to act as if you were an invisible guest at your own funeral. Wow. So they're on the front row or uh, your loved ones. You know, your family, behind them are your friends, behind them maybe your colleagues, people you work with, contractors, employees, whatever. And what would they say if they were asked to step up to the mic and give a eulogy? Mm -hmm. Now, for most people, it's a little scary because probably the people that mean the most to them, they just kind of know that maybe um, they really haven't been relating to them in the way they want to, and there's a gap mm -hmm. between what they would like for that person to say and what they would really say. And so for a lot of people, in fact, the gal we met in the lobby, Sherry, yeah. started crying when she was telling me about it. Because yeah. she said it was a very emotional experience for her. But here's the good news. You're not dead yet. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is you can begin to influence those conversations today. Steve Jobs said two years before he died, this was almost prophetic, yeah. he said death is the single best tool I've ever found for making the important decisions in life. Wow. Because he knew he was going to die. He did. Right? He did. And so we take, we take you through these legacy statements where you create these legacy statements in terms of how you want to be remembered by the people that are most significant to you. Mm. And it's a powerful, powerful exercise that's designed to do one thing, give you clarity about what's really important. Yeah. Because you can begin to inform those conversations now. My, um, and there's always conversations at a funeral. You know, you're talking about the deceased, you're talking about what they meant to you, what was the legacy of their life. And sometimes we think legacy is for somebody like, you know, Margaret Thatcher or Abraham Lincoln had a legacy mm -hmm. and Bill Clinton will have a legacy. And, but the truth mm -hmm. is all of us are going to have a legacy. Yeah. The only question is, is it going to be a good one or a bad one? What's the mark that we're going to leave in the world? So back in 2005, my father-in-law died. He was an Air Force colonel, had lived an incredible life, left behind this great legacy and his five children, including my wife, who was mm -hmm. the youngest. And he and I were very close. He meant the world to me. Mm -hmm. And so we had this full military funeral where the jets were flying wow. over and 21 gun guns salute, oh, wow. all that stuff. They, I don't think they do that anymore. It's emotional. But it was very emotional. The flag on the thing and everything. Yes, oh, presented gosh. it to my oh. mother-in-law. So then, um, fast forward to at the end of the funeral, we go back to my house, all the relatives there, all the friends, mm -hmm. and we're hauling out these photo albums. And we're just telling these stories. Mm -hmm. You know, we're laughing, we're crying, and we're talking about what he meant to us. Yeah. And it dawned on me, we can begin to engineer those conversations today yeah. by being intentional in the relationships that matter most. Mm. And so that first question is really powerful. How do you want to be remembered? Go to the end of your life, mm -hmm. get clarity, because the truth is we're not going to live forever. 
Yeah. That's kind we're of the, not. We're, I, I know it's technology a, can't advance that. Well, you know, <laughs> hopefully we're going to live longer. Longer, yeah. But probably not forever. Yeah. Maybe in like a couple thousand years, someone will figure out a way to make us live a few hundred years. Forever. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Forever. Who knows? Anything's possible in my mind. Um, interesting. So, what's your answer to the first question? Well, my answer to the first question, because I've written down these series of legacy statements, yes. and I'll just tell you a few of these. Like, I talked about Gail. Here's what I said about her. Here's how I want to be remembered. I want Gail to remember how I loved her, understood her, pursued her, and helped her accomplish her dreams. I want her to remember specific times that we shared together, times we laughed, times we cried, times we spent discussing things that were important to both of us, and times we just held one another and watched the sunset. Mm. Here, here's another one. This, this is one for my followers, because you and I you know, have yeah. followers in social media, and I actually wrote a legacy statement about those. Wow. So I said, I want them to remember my transparency, authenticity, and generosity. I want them to remember how I exceeded their expectations and gave them compelling, life-changing content and resources. Most of all, I want them to see in me a model of a life worth emulating. Wow, it's pretty powerful. So just trying to get clear on what, what the end game is here. Mm -hmm. So that's the first question. I love it, okay. So question one, get clear on the end. That's right. Okay, question two. Question two is what matters most to you? Now, most of us know what's important to our spouse or our significant other. We know what's important to our boss if we have a job. We may know what's important to our shareholders if we're running a company, mm -hmm. or what's important to our society. But this is a question about what's important to you. Because the myth is we can kind of do it all. Yeah. Well, we can do anything we want, we just can't do everything we want. So we have to make decisions. And the truth is, our lives, where you're at right today and where I'm at today, is in large part a result of all the decisions that we made along the way and our priorities. Mm. So in this exercise, what Daniel and I help you do is identify the major life accounts, and we refer to them almost like a bank account. You know, like you've got a relationship if you're married with your spouse, right. and that's like a bank account that can be overdrawn, you know, mm -hmm. or you can have a surplus in it, or you could be kind of spending what you're bringing in. Yeah. Same thing with your health, same thing if you're a parent, with, you know, same thing with your job, uh, same thing with your career, your finances, all that. So all these life accounts, how do they stack up? What's the priority? <clears throat> mm -hmm. So for me, you know, this is just, I'm a person of faith, so God comes number one. Yeah. But number two is kind of a surprise to people because I put myself number two. Then comes Gail, my wife, then my kids, then my job's like number five. Yeah. So the reason I put myself so high on the list is it's like when you, I just flew in today into San Diego. Put your mask on first. Put your mask on first. <laughs> That's it. That's exactly right. Yeah. I always tell people, you know, the most important person in the world is yourself. Yeah. And if you're neglecting all of your needs first and giving to everyone else but not to you, then you're not going to be able to serve more people. That, well, that, that's the key, what you just said, yeah. Lewis, because to me, the essence of leadership is service. Yes. I want to serve my wife. Mm -hmm. I want to serve my <laughs> kids and my sons-in-law and my grandkids. I want to serve the people that work for me. Yeah. But if I'm sick, I can't do can't that. do anything. Yeah. If my marriage is blowing up. I can't no, do that. No. If my business no. is in trouble or I'm financially spinning out of control, I can't do that. Yeah. So these priorities are really important to identify. Now, it really helps in kind of the, the warp and woof of life when you have to make some really tough decisions. Mm -hmm. Another example. In 2009, I was the CEO of Thomas Nelson. We were in the middle of the recession. It was brutal. Thomas Nelson is a publishing company. Just, it's a publishing company. Yeah. Large. It was At the time, it was <clears throat> seventh largest publishing company in the U.S. Um, was acquired by... HarperCollins, yeah. now a division of HarperCollins. And we were in the middle of the recession, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat, and we were working like crazy, just trying to keep the ship afloat. Yeah. And I was tired, I was wrung out, I wasn't spending as much time with my wife as I know I needed to, or with my family. And so I told the board, I said, I gotta have a vacation, guys, otherwise I'm just gonna burn out. And they said, great, do it. Yeah. So we decided we're gonna go to <clears throat> Colorado, deep in the Rockies, and just unplug wow. and unwind. Mm. And we love Colorado, so. Yeah. Did you go snowboarding or skiing, or were you just more just no, hanging just, out, hiking? And yeah, it, it was this at this time. It was or... the winter. Okay. So um, we were at a friend's cabin, really deep in the woods. Sure, sure. But we kind of like fantasized about this for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> yeah. So we we're flying to to Denver, where we we're going to drive up into the mountains, and we had to stop in Dallas, change planes. Yeah. And I made the mistake of checking my email. Mm. There was a message from the cool. chairman of my board. And he said, hey, change of plans. I need you back in Nashville on Monday. He said, we're coming in. He said, we've got some issues that we need to resolve. Mm. I mean, my heart sank. Oh. And I just thought, oh. 
<clears throat> so I handed my phone to Gail and I let her read it and of course she was crestfallen also. Oh. And, but to her credit, she said, honey, look, I know this is tough. You do whatever you need to do, I'll totally support it. I mean, she's always been like that. She sure, was great. Sure. So I remember my priorities, you know, me, mm -hmm. then Gail, and then the kids. And then the job. And then the job. Yeah. So I took a deep breath. It wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. But my priorities gave me courage. That's the key thing. When you and have clarity. And clarity and courage. Yeah. And when you have that, you can say no to the non-essentials so that you can say yes to what's most important. Yes. So I wrote back to the chairman and I said, hey, I understand. I really wish you'd postpone this, postpone this meeting. I said, if you can't, my team will be there to assist you. I'm going to Colorado as we discussed. See you when I get back. Wow. So I left. So I got back, I didn't check my email, but I got back from the end of that trip and I checked with my CFO when I got back. I said, hey, did the guys come in? You know, they came in from New York. And he said, um, yeah. I said, what was the meeting about? He said, uh, I don't know, but we totally could have handled it by email. Oh my God. It was like a nothing <laughs> no meeting. No big deal, yeah, yeah. No big deal. And I almost <clears throat> scuttled a much needed wow. Uh, vacation. But see, when we have priorities, we can distinguish between the urgent mm -hmm. and the important. And yeah. sometimes the urgent shows up like it's important, but it rarely is. Mm -hmm. But you got to get clear on your priorities. So we literally in the life plan have you come up with your life accounts yeah. and then arrange them in, in order. And they'll change based on the seasons in your life. Sure, sure. Right? Yeah, so you don't have any kids. Or when you're 30, it's going to be different potentially. Yeah. yeah. So it's a living document. It's a living document. Yes. You're going to tweak it for the rest of your life. I was yeah. even working on mine today coming out. So. Yeah, there you go. I like it. Okay, so the second question, again, to recap, it's more about getting clear on the plan. Right? That's right. So the first question is, how do you want to be remembered? Yep. The second question is, what's most important yep. to you? Yes. The third question is, how do you get from where you are to where you want to be in every area of your life? So that's the game plan. That's the game plan. Yes, okay. And this is where it gets really fun. Mm. So um, we break it into three parts. So we help you get really clear on what we call an envisioned future statement for mm. each category. I'll give you an example here in a minute. Then we help you look at your current reality. Because once you kind of envision the future and get really clear on where yeah. you want to go, now it's time to be brutally honest. you got to admit where you are. Yeah. Then the next uh, question you ask is, what are the specific commitments you're willing to make that will take you from where you are to where you want to be? Mm -hmm. And we keep it really simple. We don't you know, come up with this complicated plan that you're all going to figure out because it's not usually how things show up. Yeah. You know, usually you get just enough light to take the next step. Sure, sure. And as you take those things open up and you get clearer on the path. Mm -hmm. But for these people that think they've got to get totally clear before they're going to take a step or before they're going to start, you know, they're going to be disappointed. Mm. You know, that's pretty much just an excuse for not getting started. Right, right. Okay, interesting. So how do you set it up for people to create this Okay, so let me, let me give you an So again, mm -hmm. we, we really be, believe that writing is important, even if you're not a writer. Uh -huh. Because um, somebody once said, I, I can't find the source of this, but thoughts disentangle themselves passing over the lips and through pencil tips. Mm, interesting. So there's something about our thinking that when we have to write it, we get clarity for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, here's, here's a, another example uh, with my health. I love this one. And again, this is my envisioned future it's not present reality. Sure, sure. Okay. I'm moving toward it. <laughs> okay, so I say I'm lean and strong, possessing vibrant health and extraordinary fitness. And notice we write it in the present tense because mm -hmm. there's power in that. Mm -hmm. Like you're already there. Yes. Okay. And I said my heart is strong and healthy. My arteries are supple and clear of obstructions. My autoimmune system is in excellent condition. I'm disease, infection, and allergy resistant. I have more than enough energy to accomplish the tasks I undertake. This is because I control my mental focus work out six days a week, choose healthy foods, take supplements as needed, and get adequate rest. Mm. So that's my envision future statement just for my health account. Okay? So I have great clarity about what I want in my health. Right. And I've got a similar kind of statement for my business, business relationships. Yep. Everything. Amazing. Okay. And so then you got to kind of go back from that and say, okay, that's the future. Great. I'm excited about that. You know, woot. But... <laughs> Where are you today? Yes. You know, maybe you're a couch potato and you haven't worked out in six years and you know, you gotta start where you are. Yeah. But getting clear on the future is important and a lot of people bail on that. They don't give themselves permission to dream. Mm. And the book we give you permission to dream. Why do people not give themselves permission, you think? I think people go to why, or excuse me, go to how before they go to what. How am I gonna do this? Yes. How would I even achieve that? Yeah, I mean, I you can't. see this in business, right? Yeah. You know, so you see people, they say, 
uh, you try to get them to dream about their business. They go, well, I, I couldn't do that. I, I, I'm not good in front of a camera. Or I, I, I couldn't do that because I don't have the capital to invest in it. Mm -hmm. Forget the how. When you get clear on the what, the how starts showing up. Wow. So vision before strategy mm -hmm. every time, all the time. <clears throat> what would you say is your vision for your business right now, moving forward? <laughs> well, it's a big vision. Okay, what is that? So uh, <laughs> financially, we want to do $100 million. Mm -hmm. But we want to do it in a highly profitable way with 100 employees. Wow. And really as an online training company, continue yeah. to do the stuff that, that we're doing. Yeah, amazing. By when? It's probably a 10-year plan. 10-year plan, yeah. yeah. I believe it. I mean, in what, four years or five years when you got started in 2001? Or sorry, no, so 2011? 2011. 2011. 2011, you've already grown five years. so, so yeah, much. Yeah, we're almost at eight figures now. It's amazing. It's great. So we've doubled every year since we started. It's amazing. So, knock on wood. What do you think has been the key to that in five years doing that? You know, I, I think a lot of it is just hiring really great people. Mm -hmm. I, I think if, if, you don't, if you don't think you need a team, your dream's not big enough. Yeah. And so for me, what I love about having a team is that it allows me to get more and more focused on what only I do well. Because mm -hmm. like when I began, I didn't I did. do everything. You did it all. And I was a you know, handicapped CEO. I didn't know anything. Uh -huh. you know, so I'm trying to find the FedEx box, and I'm trying to book my own travel, and I'm trying right. to do all this stuff. Taking me 30 minutes doing this and that. Oh, yeah, yeah. totally inefficient. It's just <clears throat> not right. my gifting. Today, because of all, all these people helping me, um, I'm able to focus on the three things that I do best, which is create content, mm -hmm. deliver the content, and be the visionary for the company, right. kind of create the picture for the future. Yeah. And if it's not that, I don't get involved. Do Somebody it, yeah. else does it. And also building relationships probably, right? That's, yeah, building relationships is, yeah, yeah. is key too. Okay, interesting. And what do you think people try to just do too much? They don't focus on their core three or four things that they do well? Yeah, well, I think, I think what happens to a lot of guys is they, they kind of see the dream and, and become a successful solopreneur. Yeah. But they choke when they it comes time really to, to, to hire people because it's you too know, much risk. <laughs> That's interesting because you know, I'm building my team out right now. We've got about 10 people, half here in LA and half in, around the country. And you know, it's a challenge bringing new people onto the mix and the training and then you know, just connecting yeah. as you grow. How did you learn? I guess you were a CEO of a bigger company already. But if you're a solopreneur and you're trying to grow into having five people on your team or 10 people, how do you learn that skill? to manage the team. Yeah, well part of it is get all the education you can. You know, read the books, read John Maxwell yeah. on leadership, you know, mm -hmm. get all the training you possibly can. Uh, be humble and honest, you mm -hmm. know, hire a coach. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I tell you, I really believe in coaches. Yeah. I think you can go further faster yep. with a coach. You can avoid making your own mistakes by learning on somebody else's mistakes. Yeah. And so that's, that's one of the key things. I I believe in a coach too. I, I use a coach for a lot of my speeches. Before every speech, I call my coach. Good. And I just feel like I get so grounded and clear on the intention of what yeah. I want to create. And objective feedback. Yes. And I feel like, man, I always think after the speech, wow, I did a really you know, solid job. And if I didn't have the coaching beforehand, I don't think I would have done as well. Yeah, because you don't see things that the coach yeah. can see. I'll, I'll give you a good, good example. When I was the CEO of Thomas Nelson, I had this great executive coach by yeah. the name of Eileen. Brilliant. She gave me some of the best stuff. I've ever learned. Mm -hmm. So one time she's sitting in a financial review meeting where all the divisional managers are coming and they're presenting their numbers for the last month, yeah. how they did. So at the break, she calls me aside. She's like, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, mm -hmm. sure. She said, are you pissed off? And I said, no. She said, well, you might want to tell your face. Wow. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, you never smile. She said, it's intimidating. Mm. And when people are intimidating, they're not going to be forthcoming. Mm. They're going to be hiding stuff, and they're just, there's just not going to be the trust you need. Yeah. She said, you've got to smile. Wow. And now you smile all the time. And now I smile all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you got a great smile. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. But that's the kind of thing you get by having a coach. Yeah. So I, but I do think that the, the place that people get stuck as mm -hmm. business developers or business owners mm -hmm. is it, it is some risk. <clears throat> Hiding, uh, hiring somebody, yeah, right? Am I going to hire the right person? Am I going to be able to cover the overhead? I don't mm -hmm. want to build the overhead too big, too fast. And all that I get is an art. But almost every time I've hired somebody else, you know, if I've done the timing right and I've mm -hmm. really thought through the plan, my income has gone up. It pays off. Because yeah. I can keep getting more narrow in my focus and, and really stay in my unique ability. Mm, that's interesting. What would you say are like two or three things you do every single week with your team or every month that is essential in creating better unity and moving things forward? Yeah, well, a couple things. Um, 
One is that I meet with my team once a week. So my direct, team? No, just my direct reports. Okay. So, and then all of them are meeting with their direct reports. Sure, sure. So we've installed in our company something called uh, the Four Disciplines of Execution. You familiar mm. with that? No. Dude. Yeah. Tell me. It's what the bomb. <laughs> yeah. They call it 4DX. Okay. The Four Disciplines of Execution. So you come up with, in each department, your wildly important goals, your uh -huh. wigs. Uh -huh. And everything is built around that. And they talk about the difference between lead measures uh, and lag measures. So there's leading measures that tell you, you know, kind of predict the future. But like when you get your financial statements that tell you what happened last month, that's a lag measure. It's already happened. You can't yes. influence it. But a lead measure that's telling you, for example, how many leads you're generating or how your conversion is, mm -hmm. that's a lead measure. And you want to focus on that. But the book is fantastic. So we have those meetings in the company every week with wow. uh, all the employees. Um, I meet with what I call my executive team. I mean, it's not that big. But uh, once a month, I go through the financial statements. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really want everybody to be good at financial management mm -hmm. so we stay out of trouble. Yeah. Um, and we're looking, at, for example, at a 16-week cash flow. You know, what the futures. Mm -hmm. So if we can spot problems in advance, we can fix them. Mm -hmm. You know? Keep the ox out of the ditch that way. Mm, I love it. I love it. What um, are you meeting with the team at all? Are you guys yeah, so a we group meet, call as well, or do you guys? Yeah, well, check? I mean, there's just a lot of interaction. I mean, I, yeah. I especially interact with our content team and all day, and we're in Slack, you know, right, so right, right, right. you know, all over that. Uh, we do meet as an entire company once a quarter, and I do training on that leadership training. Mm -hmm. We also go through the financials. Because every person in our company gets a bonus based on the performance of the company. Really? Yep. So the whole company knows everything that you're making, everything that's coming in. Exactly. Because yeah. their their bonus is is pegged to that. We don't have any caps on the bonuses. So right. as as high as the company can make money, they can continue to make that's bonuses. That's great. That's great. And why do you keep writing books? You've written eight books now. Is that yeah. right? Why do you continue to write them? Um, What's the value in writing books in your mind? I I don't lead generation. Mm. You know, I well actually it's a couple things. That's that's a main thing. But it also establishes your authority. I mean, you've seen this with your own Yeah, book. it's been a game changer. Total game changer. There's nothing that credentials you in this culture. Not a PhD, not a hit movie. I mean, that's going to come and go. But right. you write a book, and all of a sudden, you know, you're somebody. Right. You know, people really respect that. Now, are you still someone today when everyone's writing a book and everyone's self-publishing? Totally. You're totally. still... There's still a mystique about that. Really? Yeah. Huh. Okay. And so for me, I mean, I've got the next five books mapped out that I want to do. Really? Yeah. And right now we're, I'm just telling you before we started, yeah. um, we're about to go shop a three book deal. Three book deal, yeah. So my, my plan is to release, and this will be, the first one will be out for 18 months, but to release a new book every year. Why every year? Is that too much? Because I've got a lot of books I want to write. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that, more than that would definitely be too much, and that's mm -hmm. kind of borderline too much. But yeah, yeah. Interesting. Can you say what they are, the ideas? Yeah. Uh, so my next book is going to be um, a book around goal setting. You know, I've got that course, Five Days to Your Best uh -huh, Year Ever. Yeah. And so I'm doing a um, book called Life Score. And um, you came up with a test called that too, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we did Smart. an assessment that just yeah, blew, blew up. up, right? And yeah. so people want to know what their number is. Interesting. And then how do you move the number? So that's going to be the next book. Then I'm doing a book on productivity. Mm -hmm. After that, I'm doing a course on productivity this summer. Wow. And the tentative title on that's called Free Time because that's. We're not going to try to help you do more. We're going right. to try to help you do less so right. you can live more. Right. Right? I like that. And then the third book is going to be a book, the working title on it's called The Intentional Leader, but it's just a book on leadership. Interesting. One of the John Maxwell. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Doesn't he have a book called Intentional Living? Last he does. Book? Yeah. So Intentional yeah. Leadership. But my company's been called Intentional Leadership. Right, 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 right. Long before his book. Exactly. Came. Yeah, yeah. It's great. <laughs> who, uh, who do you look up to the most? Or who do you watch like pretty closely that you're like, wow, they're just doing a great job with what they're doing in this space? Other than you? Other than me, yeah, yeah. Um, well, John Maxwell he's on crushing. leadership is just amazing. He's crushing. He's, he's a good friend. Yeah. And I published him at Thomas Nelson for uh -huh. more than a decade. Um, but I look to guy, I think Pat Flynn is mm -hmm. killing it. I just yeah. love the consistent quality of the content. Mm -hmm. His book, uh, Will It Fly? Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. You read that? Yeah, I skimmed it, yeah. I bought 10 copies of it and gave it to all the guys yeah, in my yeah. mastermind. Yeah, that's great. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tony Robbins, Tony constantly inspires me. Mm. What about someone not in this space? Just someone in general who's like building a brand. Maybe it's not an online brand, but just building a brand that you're like, wow, they're just doing a great job. Maybe mm. it's a celebrity or politician or someone in a different space. You're like, man. I can't think of one. Can't think of one? No. Sorry. That's okay. It's okay. 
What is the biggest challenge for you right now in your business? Um, I think the biggest challenge is to not overcommit on my time because I've got so much stuff I want to do. Yeah. And so many opportunities, right? There are. And, and I think mm. that scarcity shows up for me in kind of a funky way. And it's like there's not enough time. So I've got to do it all this year. Yeah. And my team keeps saying, there's plenty of time. Yeah. Slow it down. Let's just really focus. Um, and the thing I don't want to do either, I want to build a company that doesn't swallow people whole. What do you mean? I mean, I want, life? Yeah, they have a life. Yeah. You know, so I want for my people, I mean, I think my success is measured not in how big my company gets, but whether I create an environment for the people that are working in it so they can have work-life balance, they can realize their own dreams, their dreams of their family, their mm -hmm. dreams for their own careers. Yeah. And if, I, and if I can't help them do that, I want to help them move on to someplace else that can do that. That's good. Who was the most influential person in your life growing up? Strangely, my dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, he went through a really dark period when he was really drinking a lot and mm -hmm. alcoholic. And it influenced me kind of in two ways. I mean, early on, um, like when I was in grade school, my dad was my constant companion. We fished, we played baseball, built model airplanes, all that. But then as life started coming at him, he, and I, I didn't know this at the time, but he was really suffering from this severe war injury mm -hmm. that he got in the Korean War. And um, I remember at one point in my life, I looked at him when he was passed out, and I said, I will never be like that. Wow. And that became the driving force of my life. And I overcorrected. He was in the drift, uh -huh. right? I overcorrected and became driven. Mm. And I think that's why I'm so committed in this book to living a designed life. You know, you can be, you can drift, you can be driven, or you can design. Mm. And I think living a designed life is so critical. By the way, one thing I didn't finish on this. All this takes to create a life plan is just a day, to set a day aside and do it. Mm. And that's really what we recommend. We walk you through the whole day yeah. to do it. But if you think about the fact that the average person spends five hours shopping on the internet to buy a car, that doesn't include the negotiation or the test drives, mm. but just to buy the car, the average bride spends 21 days planning a wedding. At least, probably, right? I know. And I've, more. I have five daughters, as you know. Oh, my, I know. Four of them are married. Gosh. So I've been through this four times. Oh, my gosh. That's but, like a year of your life. <laughs> from just a wedding planning. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Right? Unbelievable. But um, to, to spend a day thinking through what it is you want out of life doesn't seem like a lot to ask. No, it's not much at all. So we walk you through that. I like that. I like that. What would you say is the biggest lesson your dad taught you? Um, I think the biggest lesson, my dad continues to teach me this, he's 82, mm. he's in good health, he's the most positively optimistic person I've ever met, even though he suffers from chronic pain. Mm. But um, we go over there typically to his house and my mom's house uh, once a week. And I mean, they're just, they don't complain, even though they could. Yeah. They're just positive and upbeat. I remember there were times when I was going through some business crisis or something, I didn't know who to call, so I called my dad and said, Dad, here's the situation. And my dad said, well, son, I don't understand anything about that. <laughs> but here's what I do know. You're gonna do fine. Mm. He said, you just hang in there, you're gonna do fine. You've got what it takes. Yeah. And to hear that from your father is one of the best gifts yeah. you can ever get. It's pretty powerful. Wow. What about when you're a CEO? Um, the publishing company, what was the biggest lesson you learned through that process of being a CEO? Well, I think um, a lot of things. I mean, I think that, you know, when I became a CEO, I really did wonder if I had what it took. Mm. I had 650 employees. Oh my gosh. We were doing a quarter of a billion a year. Wow. A lot of pressure. <clears throat> and, you know, you kind of have to put on the face of confidence, like, you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But you go home at night, and in the darkness you're of the like, night, what am I doing? you're thinking, it's only a matter of time before they figure out. I don't know what I'm doing. But you know, I've spoken to CEOs all over the world. Mm. All CEOs feel that way. Really? Yeah, the ones that don't are the ones you need to worry about. Mm. But most people that are in positions of significant leadership have that kind of self-doubt. But the good thing about it is it keeps you humble. Yeah. And it keeps you hungry. And it keeps you alert. And so after a while, I learned to embrace it. You know, just go, you know what, this is good. This is kind of how my body set up. It's kind of like when I do public speaking now, and I always get nervous before I speak. Mm -hmm. Do you get nervous? Yeah, sometimes. Less, less nervous now than less, I used to, yeah, for sure. I, I, I've been, the book tour really helped me get over a lot of it, because yeah. I just did a speech after speech after speech, so I kind of felt like, okay, I got a lot of the nerves out. 
But if I don't speak for a few months and I get a big speech again, it's like, ooh, I forget, yeah. I forget what this is like. You know? Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, I just, I kind of had this mantra that I rehearsed to myself before I go up on stage. In fact, I got several of them, but one of them is just, this is my body's way of preparing me for peak performance. Mm. Feeling the nerves. Yeah, feeling the nerves. Right. I'm just like, I've, I've learned to in, embrace it yeah. and just go, oh. Get ready. Train that thing's time. showing up again. Yeah, yeah. And good. so now I kind of reinterpret it as, <clears throat> as being excited. Now, you know, occasionally that didn't work. Yeah, yeah. But most of the time it does. <laughs> okay. Um, and what about from the last five years? What's the biggest lesson going on your own, not having this big company behind you, but starting kind of from scratch and a new phase of your life? What's the thing yeah, the lesson you've learned? I, I think that there's always more. There's always another level you can go to. Because I really thought, I remember when I first um, started, I thought if I can just get my company to a million dollars a year. And then, you know, you kind of you hit that mountain and you realize, oh my gosh, there's a whole mountain range over there. You know, and then it was five million and then, you know, whatever. But I just think that realizing that there's always another level. And there's always another level for me to grow. And that's, I remember having this conversation with somebody, I won't mention her name, but you and I both know her. And she said, How, when is enough enough? Mm. And I said, well, first of all, that's a great question. Yeah. But, you know, certainly in terms of material things, I don't need any more stuff. Sure. You probably don't either. Yeah. You've got a but, great home. and Yeah, i got a great home yeah. and I've got, you know, all the toys. I'm, I'm going to get bored with that stuff. Yeah. That doesn't really challenge me anymore. But i tell you what really does challenge me and why it'll never be enough, no matter how big my company gets, is because I, I like what has to happen to me in order to grow to that next level. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I, I have to develop new capabilities, mm -hmm. new intellectual capabilities, new emotional stamina, whatever it is. But that's like why I, I keep pressing for the next level. Mm, I love that, I love that. That's why I hate, by the way, the word retirement. What are you gonna do when you retire? That's what I understand. I, like, I mean. What do people do when they retire? Die. I don't, I don't get this. Most of them die within five years after they retire. Really? Do you know Dan Sullivan? Uh, the coach? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, I'm in Dan's strategic coach uh -huh. program. Phenomenal program, by the way. That's what I hear. And Dan is 71 years old. Dan has a 25-year plan for his life. Wow. Really? And one of his basic principles that I love is he says, you've got to create a future that's bigger than your past. Hmm. Now think about the people you know. There's people that you and I both know that their past is bigger than their future. Yeah. It's like they're still living in the glory days. You know, probably people we a lot went of to high pro, school with. A lot of former pro athletes yes. live in the past of like what they did 10 years ago. That's right. And they never create something powerful moving forward. And it's just a matter of time before they die. Wow. But if you can reverse that and say, no, the, I'm going to create a future that's always bigger than my past. Hmm. Now, how can I do that? Because the truth is we're not dead yet, so I still think we have a purpose here. Yeah. Interesting. In fact, I think if we're not dead, we probably haven't fulfilled the purpose for which we were created. Wow. Okay. So, so you're always trying to create something bigger. Yep. And, and by bigger, I don't mean more money. Deeper I just impact. Mean deeper impact, yeah, yeah, yeah. more reach, yeah. more significance. More creativity for yourself yep. as well, probably, yeah. Exactly. Interesting. What's something you really want to learn over the next five to 10 years that you haven't learned yet? I, I just want to come, become a better and better content developer mm -hmm. and develop my skills there in speaking and uh, delivery and video and all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time I see something that somebody else has done that's really great, you're like, oh, I want to do that. I've got to, <laughs> wow. Like, I just deconstruct it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a never ending quest. Uh, yeah, it's cool. Okay. Okay, so it's the last day. Actually, no, it's not the last day. You're actually the invisible guest at your funeral. Better yet, your father comes back and is at your funeral 50, how many years from now, and he's about to go up to the mic and say something. What do you want him to say? Oh. And how many people are there? I hope a lot. So what does he walk up and say? What would you love for him to say? You know, my dad tells me this a lot. Mm. But what I'd like him to say is he was proud of me. That he felt like he was amazed that I mm. realized my potential. That he's proud of me for loving Gail, my wife, mm -hmm. for all these years, for being committed to my family, um, for making an impact in the world. Yeah. You know, th that I was a good steward of what I'd been given. That's really what I'm looking for. Mm. You know, that I, that I leave nothing on the field. Yeah. That I played full out, that I died with my boots on, and that I gave it everything. Mm. That's cool. You like make that. me cry. I like that, yeah. <laughs>
What about your daughter? What would your daughter say or one of your daughters? You know, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, one of the things that uh, Gail did for me about eight years ago is that she had all of my daughters record about a mm. five minute thing for me. Oh my God. I still have it on I'd be phone. like in tears probably if oh I had five gosh. daughters. They all, well, she, oh my God. Get this, she did it. She had my five daughters. Oh my gosh. She had um, my, a couple of my grandkids. She had my wow. best friends. Oh my gosh. And then she, then she took my favorite music and so she'd have one of them say something and play a song. That, <laughs> so then she sent me out into the woods. Oh, you're like in tears. And it's I was like, like for three hours. Oh my I was, gosh. I was just, I should play one of them for you sometime. I mean, I was just in tears. Oh my gosh. What was this for? Our birthday or it's Father's just, Day? Or it was or? when I turned 50. Wow. Amazing. And I, I just, occasionally I'll just still listen to it and just wow. cry like a baby. Oh my gosh. But I think, I think, I mean, you asked what the girls would say or what one of my daughters would say. I, I think there's one thing I, I learned as a, a dad of daughters, mm -hmm. and I don't mean this in a sexist kind of way, but as it turns out, girls like to talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I spent a lot of time listening. Yeah. And I think it really honed my skills as a listener. Mm. And so I, I can remember when one of my daughters, um, she just broke up with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they, they had been together in Switzerland at this school, and they it had been a really meaningful relationship. Mm, it's tough. And so he, he broke the relationship, and she came home. And I just held her hand, and she just cried. And I just think just being with her, mm -hmm. I didn't say anything. But I can tell you, these various times when I would sit with my daughters, and they would pour out their heart, and I wouldn't say anything. And they'd get up and give me a big hug, and they'd say, Dad, that was so awesome. Thanks <laughs> yeah. for your counsel. And I'm like, yeah. I didn't say anything. <laughs> Wow, what are you really listening for when you're listening to someone? I'm listening for their heart. Mm. Because here's what I can do if I'm not careful. I can go into CEO fix-it mode. Coaching. <clears throat> yeah, like, okay, I got it figured out. You need to take these three steps. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, they throw things at me when I start yeah, that. Yeah, sure. And, and Gail's really helped me with that, too. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I started doing that with her when I came home from the office, and she said she got really mad pointed her finger at me, and she said, let me just tell you something. You may be the CEO of Thomas Nelson, but you're not the CEO here. Wow, and she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I love that. What's something, final few questions, what's something that you're really proud of that you haven't really talked about much, or maybe not a lot of people know about? Wow. Um, well, I don't like to talk about this, but I, I, I do like giving, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I, I think that's part of my responsibility as somebody who's has means is to be a philanthropist. Yeah. And so, again, it's not something I talk about. I've never said that, I've never been asked that direct of a question, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's important to me to give to causes that are really yeah. meaningful. Sure, and do you, do you give a certain percentage every year or is it more just when you feel? I keep trying to up it. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so I've you know, started at 10% and yeah. <clears throat> have just continued to raise that. Do you feel like the more you give financially, the more you earn? Totally. Yeah. No, I don't do it for that reason. Right, but it's just a cause. But it's just, right? it, but it's just a, <clears throat> it is a kind of an interesting thing that happens. Right. Every really, you know, Tony Robbins, he said that, that yeah. when, when he does that, he, he always on your makes show, more. Yeah, he always makes more. And a lot of people say that, like, the key to actually generating wealth is giving wealth away. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, things. my own philosophy is you just, you know, again, I'm a person of faith. I just think yeah. God is extravagant in what he's given to us. Mm -hmm. And he's constantly giving. Yeah. And so I want to be that kind of person that's constantly giving. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mostly behind the scenes, but <clears throat> I just, I, sure. I love the thought of that. If you could have one word tattooed on your forehead that was reversed, you saw in the mirror in the morning, or every time you were in the mirror, you had to get a tattoo, what would the word be? Um, or phrase. Yeah. Well, it's kind of cliche because of everything we've been talking about, but it's be intentional, mm -hmm. you know design your future, but I think just be intentional. That's cool, I like that. Okay, this is the last couple questions. Um, <clears throat> again, it's the last, since you brought the whole funeral into this, uh, since your last day and you're about to pass, this is 50, 60 years from now, you're about to pass, everyone's there, they're all happy and joyful moment, and every book you've ever written is erased, all this stuff is deleted, they've created your courses, everything and your great, great, great grandson or granddaughter comes and says, we have a piece of paper, you just write down the three things that you know to be true about your life and your experience. The, the, most, important, wow. the most important things, 
we can't have access to any more of your books. We don't know the life plan. We don't know all these things. But what are the three most important things? And that's all we'll remember you by from these three things wow. that you write down. What would you say? No pressure. No pressure. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, well, this is something I've said before, but I, I, I want to say it. It's not, it, it's this. It's you're, you're not as smart as you think you are, mm -hmm. but you have more potential than you can possibly imagine. So I think it's really important to stay humble and, yeah. and aggressive, be an aggressive learner. That's probably the second thing, if it's not encapsulated in the first one, is just uh, commit yourself to lifelong learning. Uh, I think that's the thing I saw in my father that was so impressive. My dad's always been the kind of guy, um, he joined the Marine Corps when he was 17, finish, didn't finish high school, except by GED while he was in the military, mm -hmm. but has always been an incredibly aggressive learner. So if he decided he wanted to learn something, he'd go buy all the books and just start yeah. pouring through them. Yeah. And I saw him do that time and time again. So I think be an aggressive learner. And I'd say the third thing is make it your life goal to love well the people that matter most. Because mm. at the end of the day, I mean, that's what people are going to be. Yeah. They're right. That's it. That's it. So nobody says, you know, everybody points this out, nobody says, gee, I wish I'd spent more time at work. Yeah. Or I wish I'd written one more book. Or made more money. Or made more money. Can't take it with you. No, you can't. Yeah. I love that. That's good. Three, three truths. What are you most grateful for in your life recently? Um, I just think the privilege of living at this time, mm -hmm. at this moment, where we have it's things amazing. like the internet. It's amazing. Where we can build these businesses, yeah. have the kind of freedom to create, kind of create the life, design the kind of lives we want. I just think it's the most amazing time. Yeah. I, I mean, I wonder, will they be saying this 100, 200 yeah. years from now? Probably. <laughs> Who knows? But it's, it's just, I just feel so grateful yeah. for that. That's cool. Uh, before I ask the final question, I want to make sure everyone goes and gets the book, Living Forward. And you can go to michaelhyatt.com to get all the information there, subscribe to your newsletter. Where are you hanging out the most online for people to connect with you personally? Uh, probably Facebook today. Yeah, mm -hmm. facebook.com forward slash Michael Hyatt. There you go. Awesome. And um, before I ask the final question, I want to acknowledge you, Michael, for your incredible intentional leadership. Because, again, I've told you this many times before, that you are like this... Uh, the top person I think of when I think of integrity and, inten mm. and being intentional and grounded you. in you're such a symbol of inspiration I believe for me and for so many mm. people I mean just the person Sherry who we met at the, in the lobby here you know just so many people love what you're doing it's because you live such a great life and you're a great example for the rest of us so well, I want to acknowledge you for your constant ability to learn to grow mm. and to give uh, unselfishly to so many people wow. so well, I appreciate that. that. Yeah, Thank you. Of course. Final question is what's your definition of greatness? Um, my de definition of greatness is somebody who makes a huge contribution in the lives of others. Somebody who actually stands for the greatness of other people. Mm. And somebody who's persistent and won't give up on other people till that greatness is manifest in them. And I think all of us need somebody like that. Somebody who will stand for that when we're in a dark place, when we're wondering if we've got what it takes. Mm -hmm. But somebody that can stand for us and say, you know what, I believe in you, Lewis. I'm standing for you. Michael Hyatt, thanks so much for coming thanks, on. Lewis. Appreciate it. Great to be with you. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, then make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can do that by clicking right here to subscribe because each week we come out with awesome, epic, and inspiring interviews and messages and videos just for you. So click subscribe right here to get notified of new videos every week. Also, if you enjoyed this specific interview, we've got a lot of great interviews like this that are uplifting and inspiring. So click right here to watch the previous interviews because the people I've had on are pretty cool and epic as well. So click here to watch previous interviews. Click here to subscribe. I love you guys, and I'll see you very soon.